This video is the seventh in a series on the 33 Strategies of War by Robert Greene. War is a state of conflict between opposing nations, societies, or groups, and a strategy is a plan of action or a policy designed to achieve major or overall aim within a conflict. This series, as always, is not intended to glorify the violence of war, rather the strategies and examples given will encompass all manner of human conflicts. Violence is always avoidable, but conflict within a human society is not. Conflict is a natural part of our social evolution of ideas and system of government, which means these strategies are useful in confronting and overcoming the obstacles that stand in the way of our shared goals and desired achievements, such as in business, politics, and relationships. Strategy 7. Transform your war into a holy war. The morale strategy. I should note that in Green's original text, he used the word crusade, which is a holy war from the perspective of the Christian faith. I feel more comfortable using the term holy war as it applies more broadly to all faiths. And in the modern era, we should embrace the use of broad terms that unite us in our shared human values rather than divide us. Part 1. Create a Just Cause The secret to motivating people and maintaining their morale is to get them to think less about themselves and more about the group. Involve them in a cause, a crusade against a hated enemy. Robert Greene Success in warfare requires the maintenance of cooperation, group cohesion, and morale. Humans are selfish by nature. We think of our own needs and desires foremost. It is the job of a leader to create and maintain the necessary motivation to seek a shared outcome. In a war, that motivation can naturally come from outside the group, the enemy. However, it's hard to maintain morale if all you do is represent opposition to an enemy. In warfare, you are asking somebody to lay down their life, to sacrifice the thing they cherish most, their very existence. In order to achieve that level of devotion, you must articulate a cause, a shared ideal, or value that the group represents. That is so universally important that the group as a whole will be willing to lay down their lives to see it advance. The most famous holy wars from which Green took the name the Crusades began in 1074. Pope Gregory VII began planning the wars that would become the Crusades after witnessing several turnovers in the rulers of Jerusalem and Palestine. But it was Pope Urban II, his successor to ruler of the Catholic Church, which at the time held dominion over most of the European monarchies that began the war, which was envisioned as a new kind of war, an armed pilgrimage to the birthplace of the Christian religion. The Pope deemed this cause of capturing the Holy Land as so noble an effort that he offered a reward in heaven, in the form of a remission of sins, an entrance into an eternal afterlife to all those who took up the cross. The war would be known as the Crusades, and the knights who fought in it were known as Crusaders. Is it true that in Jerusalem I can erase my sins? of my wife. We can find out together. The 2005 film Kingdom of Heaven is a highly fictionalized account of the end of the Second Crusades. By the start of the events in the film, Jerusalem has been under Christian rulership for over a hundred years. Since the kingdom still needs defending, the Pope's eternal rewards continue to motivate for European elites and poor alike to take up the cross. To kill an infidel. Hope is saved. It's not murder. It is the path to heaven. The holy war spreads to the growing Muslim population that began to organize around their own dynamic leader, Salahuddin, who organized a coalition of Muslim kingdoms to create an army with the expressed cause of ejecting the Christians from their ancestral lands and recapturing all lost kingdoms, Jerusalem being the most important. You promised. You promised to return Jerusalem. Don't forget. This cause took the form of an armed jihad, the Muslim term that means to strive in the way of God, which has other meanings besides violence and war. 
Christians may also use their word crusade in other contexts as well. But the two words, although similar, are not interchangeable. The true cause of the conflict on both sides were economic and geopolitical in nature. But who would fight for a ruler who simply wanted more money, land, or power? What know you, Saladin? That he is king of the Saracens, and that he surrounds this kingdom. He has 200,000 men in Damascus alone. He could win a war if he goes to war. If I do not deliver war, I have no peace. The king of Jerusalem will die soon. The Christians will make the war you need. Here from this room, I keep the peace as far as it can be kept. But Salah Hadin and the king between them would make a better world. And it's only for a while, Tiberius, it still has. So the leaders framed both political conflicts around the advancement and protection of a group's shared values in the form of their respective religious affiliations. An army of Jesus Christ, which bears his holy cross, cannot be beaten. God wills it. God wills it. This made for a compelling motivation of troops and ensured that each was dedicated to the cause. Religion has been used as a motivating factor throughout many conflicts. In short, Mr. Pym, you are asking me to relinquish my sovereign power over Parliament. You know, as I do, that even as we sit here, the Scots rebels are invading this land. The Scots invade our land. And all is urgency and alarm. In the past 12 months, our Irish colonists have been slaughtered, our churches desecrated. Would you have me declare war on the entire Catholic world, Mr. Cromwell? It is your duty to defend our church, sir. During the English Civil War, Oliver Cromwell struggled commanding his army against the king's more professional soldiers. Hold your ground in the name of God! Hold your ground! He found that the paid soldiers of his armies were acting more like mercenaries who preferred to plunder than fight and at times refused to confront the enemy at all for fear of losing their own lives. In our ranks it will better this war were never fought. Not a drop of English blood soiled this English land. The battle is not yet lost, Cromwell. This battle was lost before it ever began, my lord. And in like manner so will this war. In the morning I'm returning to Cambridge. This war will not be won with untrained plowmen, apprentices, old decaying serving men. We need men with fire in their bowels who fear the Lord but not the enemy. He reformed and re-enlisted his army, this time filling the ranks with those devoted to his Puritan ideals. Take care of yourself, William. The Lord will take care of me, Squire. Have faith, John. I have pride. Which Come instilled on, a cause against the monarchy. And it was this army that Cromwell used to defeat the king. In order to maintain morale, a leader must ensure the basic needs of his army are met. You must keep their bellies filled and bodies rested. And at times, their resolve to advance the cause for which they fight must also be nourished. In the 1993 film Gettysburg, Colonel Joshua Chamberlain, played by Jeff Daniels, takes command of a group of mutineers from another regiment. The men have refused to continue to fight in the war just before entering the town of Gettysburg. And you're welcome to them. You're authorized to use whatever force necessary, Colonel. You want to shoot him? Go right ahead. You are relieved, Captain. The Colonel, who is short of manpower in his own regiment, first takes care of the mutineers' basic needs by ensuring that they are well fed. What did eat last? When did you have something to eat? They're trying to break us by not feeding us. I'll get the cook going. Meat may be a little raw, but there's not much time to cook. He then takes care of their spiritual needs by reminding them of the cause. The whole Reb army is up that road a ways waiting for us, so this is no time for an argument like this, I tell you. We could surely use you fellas. We're now well below half strength. This is a different kind of army. You look back through history, you will see men fighting for pay, for women, for some other kind of loot. They fight for land. Power. But we are here for something new. This has not happened much in the history of the world. We are an army out to set other men free. The cause of the American Civil War compared to other examples is not based in shared religious beliefs, but one of shared values. It's the idea 
that we all have value. It was America that wrote down in their own Declaration of Independence from Great Britain that all men are created equal and have the rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. It was that shared value that the men of the Union Army had taken up as their cause, that they would be willing to die to see advance. This was their holy war. Sorry, I uh, didn't mean to preach. Part 2. Band them together. Make them see their survival as tied to the success of the army as a whole. Robert Greene. The final battle in the film Kingdom of Heaven is the siege of Jerusalem that would end the Second Crusade. The Crusader Knight Balian of Ibelin, played by Orlando Bloom, volunteers to lead the defense of the city against the Haladin's forces. At this time, sieges of cities were violent affairs for the inhabitants, and Balian uses this to motivate and rally the common and lower class Christians to fight against the besiegers. When this wall comes down, there will be no quarter. God has sent you this day to take your prisoners as they did. So shall it be done. If you throw down your arms, your families will die. He goes as far as to knight several members of the lower class, an honor that is commonly reserved for royalty. Every man at arms, or capable of bearing them, kneel! In their oaths, he has them swear to not only be courageous in battle, be without fear in the face of your enemies, to be brave and upright that God may love me, but also ensure the protection of the innocent. Guard the helpless. That is your own. Rise a knight! Rise a knight! His goal is not to defeat the large army. He knows that is not possible. He only wishes to put up enough defense that the besiegers would allow for an orderly retreat of the city's inhabitants. Which is a reminder that there are other outcomes in war than victories and defeats. In the 2003 film, Master and Commander, Far Side of the World, Captain Jack Aubrey, played by Russell Crowe, commands Her Majesty's ship, the Surprise, in an attack against a French man of war. Using a simple call and response technique, he reminds the men of the consequences should they lose the upcoming engagement. That's not good enough. We need to fire two broadsides to her one. You want to see a guillotine in Piccadilly? No! You want to call that raggedy ass Napoleon your king? No! You want your children to sing the Marseillaise? No! Mr. Mord, Mr. Pulling, stop a battery! But just prior to the attack, he takes a moment for a softer approach. England is under threat of invasion. And though we be on the far side of the world, this ship is our home. This ship is England. To tie both the men and the ship and its crew together in one common cause. So it's every hand to his rope or gun, quicks the word and sharps the action. After all, surprise is on our side. <laughs> and sometimes there's nothing that brings men together like a good laugh. Part 3. Play to their emotions. In a group in which people are truly bonded, moods and emotions are so contagious that it becomes easy to infect the troops with enthusiasm. Robert Greene. Humans are social creatures. We communicate with our emotions, and those emotions spread rapidly in the group setting. The good leader can sense these sways in morale and know how to play to the group's feelings to sway their emotion and behavior. In the 1995 film Braveheart, a highly fictionalized depiction of the Scottish War of Independence, you see William Wallace, played by Mel Gibson, rally Scottish soldiers that are losing heart after sighting the larger English force. They have become overwhelmed by fear and revert to their own finite selfish desires for survival. Individually at first, I'm not dying for these bastards! Let's go home! And then the notion spreads throughout the group despite the pleas of their leader. Men, do not flee! Wallace takes over for the failed leader and delivers an impassioned speech. I am William Wallace. William Wallace.
Dallas is seven feet tall. Yes, I've heard. And if he were here, he'd consume the English with fireballs from his eyes and bolts of lightning from his arse. Starting with a good joke to break the tension. He then tries a call and response. What will you do without freedom? Will you fight? That? No! We will run! And we will live at least a while. He is able to turn the tide of emotion from one of fear and self-preservation. Many years from now, would you be willing to train all the days from this day to that? To one of defiance against their hated enemy. For just one chance to come back here and tell our enemies that they may take our lives but they'll never take our freedom! He reminds them of the cause that brought the two armies to the field that day, the ideals of being ruled by a king of their own heritage, and the universal value of freedom from a foreign oppressor. Part 4. Follow me. Lead from the front! Let your soldiers see you in the trenches making sacrifices for the cause. That will fill them with the desire to immolate and please you, Robert Greene. In the 1957 film Pass of Glory, fictionalized accounts of a World War I French battalion on the Western Front, Colonel Dax, played by Kirk Douglas, leads an assault into no man's land. As a true leader should, he is the first one out of the trench and continues to lead the way towards the German trenches. His men follow closely behind despite the heavy fire. While well, the next trench over, the officer never made it to no man's land. Sergeant, where's Pete? Oh, when Colonel Dax looks over, he sees that he has returned to the safety of his own trench, and his men had followed him. An officer's job is to lead. You cannot expect a common soldier to go farther upfield than his leader. All the casual. All right! Let's give it another try! Come on! Let's give it, it is important that a leader endure the same conditions as their soldiers. How will they know the strength of their men after marching if he is riding a horse? Seeing you've already been down with the heat, please, will you ride the horse, Colonel, that the good Lord provide instead of marching around in the hot, damn, dirty dust? Will you walk? Colonel, do you mind? Oh, Good officer doesn't ride all day. I've been sitting hey, long anyway. Hey, what's going on here? He's cooked for 150, sir, and he only wants to give us half. How will they know if their men are well fed if they do not eat with them? Looks pretty good. Yes, sir. Serve the whole issue. The men can use it. Yes, sir. And bring me a plate, too. Yes, sir. How will he know their emotional state if he does not listen to them? It would be a great help if I could talk to you about the men from time to time. In the 1993 film Glory, about the first black regiment, the United States Army. You men enlisted in this regiment on the understanding that you would be paid the regular army wage of $13 a month. This morning I have been notified that since you are a colored regiment, you will be paid $10 a month. The newly enlisted soldiers revolt when they learn they will be receiving a lower wage than white soldiers. They do not refuse to muster or to fight. Instead, they elect to receive no compensation for their service in protest of inequality. In a show of solidarity, their leader, Colonel Shaw, played by Matthew Broderick. If you men will take no pay, then none of us will. Joins their protest and goes without pay himself. Part 5. Mix harshness and kindness, but be ruthless to grumblers. Make both reward and punishment rare but meaningful. Remember, a motivated army can work wonders, making up for any lack of material resources. Robert Green. In the film Glory, Colonel Shaw leads a group of American citizens that needs no reminder of the cause for which they are fighting for. They are more familiar with the harsh conditions of their fellow black Americans that continue to live in bondage than any other. However, in the film, Colonel Shaw reluctantly disciplines a soldier for sneaking out of camp by method of flogging. Seat. On further inquiring why the dedicated soldier would break military discipline, he discovers that the men 
have not been given proper equipment. The boy was off trying to find himself some shoes, Colonel. He wants to fight. Same as the rest of us. More even. The Colonel corrects this mistake. In the future, he offers merit-based rewards to soldiers. They provide for better communication and leadership within the ranks. Therefore, in recognition of initiative taken not only for yourself, but on behalf of the entire regiment, you are hereby awarded the rank of Sergeant Major. Congratulations. Hip, hip. Which increases his ability to maintain the morale of the unit. Belly grumbling is an epidemic in military units, and bad attitudes spread as quickly as disease between men. It is the job of a silver-tongued leader to squash these complainers before they can spread their fear and discontent. An example of this comes from Shakespeare's Henry V, when the young boy king must rally his smaller force of English knights and longbowmen just before the Battle of Agincourt. The king has rode himself to view their battle. Of fighting men, they have full threescore thousand. That's five to one. Besides, they are all fresh. It was a complaint that sparked Henley to deliver perhaps the most famous motivational speech of all time. The complaint came from the mouth of a noble leader, griping that the English had too few men compared to the French force, and that the English were too tired after long months spent marching from England. This fearful odds. Oh, that we now had here but one ten thousand of those men in England that do no work today. What's he that wishes so? My cousin Westmoreland. Henry's first task was to shame even the thought behind the complaint. Oh, my fair cousin, we are marked to die. We are now to do our country loss. And if to live, the fewer men, the greater share of honor. Taking the negative and turning it into a positive, putting his men's mind not on the finite-minded goal of survival, but the infinite-minded goal of honor. God's will, I pray thee, wish not one man more. By Jove, I am not covetous for gold, nor care I who doth feed upon my cost. It yearns me not to mend my garments where such outward things dwell not in my desires. If it is a sin to covet honor, then I am the most offending soul. <laughs> <laughs> he doubles down on his ploy by offering the men a way out of the fight. No faith, my cuz. Wish not a man from England. God's peace. I would not lose so great an honor as one man more, methinks, would share from me for the best hope I have. Oh, do not wish one more. Brother, proclaim it, Westmoreland, through my host, that he which hath no stomach to this fight, let him depart. His passport shall be made. In terms for convoy put into his purse, we would not die in that man's company that fears his fellowship to die with us. He bets that the shame will spread just as quickly as the fear did. He then binds them together by reminding them of their shared heritage. This day is called the Feast of Crispian. To remind the men of their shared bond of culture and religion. He that outlives this day and comes safe home will stand a tiptoe when this day's name and rouse him at the name of Crispian. He that shall see this day and live old age will yearly on the vigil feast his neighbors and say, oh. Tomorrow is St. Crispin's. <laughs> and it always helps to get a laugh. Then will he strip his sleeves, show his scars, and say, These wounds I had on Crispin, say, old men forget, yet all shall be forgot. But he'll remember, with advantages, what feats he did that day. Then shall our names familiar in his mouth as household words. Harry the King, Bedford and Exeter. Warwick and Talbot, Salisbury and Gloucester, be in their flowing cups freshly remembered. And this story shall the good man teach his son. The final reward offered is a badge of fellowship and masculinity for all those he fights alongside. And Crispin Crispian shall ne'er go by from this day to the ending of the world. But we in it shall be remembered. We few, we happy few, we band of brothers. He sheds his blood with me shall be my brother. Be he ne'er so vile, this day 
shall gentle his condition. And gentlemen in England now obey shall think themselves a curse they were not here. And hold their manhoods cheap whilst any speaks. Fought with us. Upon some Crespin! The reversal. All strategies have their drawbacks, their flaws, their undefended flanks, their exposed sides, and morale is no different. My king, I'm a fighting man. I don't like no belly aching. I won't tolerate in any of my units. I lost many a man. Young ones never been with a woman. Some died of disease. Some were butchered in Scythia by the banks of the Oxus. Some died good. And the sun, we fought for you. Some of us, 50 battles we've been in. We killed many a barbarian. All we wish for is to see our children and our wives and our grandchildren one last time before we join our brothers in that dark house they call Hades. Just as blossoming enthusiasm is contagious, and so is fear, resent, loathing of a leadership that neglects and abuses the soldiers. A leader that makes a promise must follow through with their own convictions. To fail to live up to their promises will have the opposite effect on morale. I pay for your bastard children. I've taken nothing for myself. And all I've asked of you is one more month. Sorry. If the leader becomes unable to contain his own ego, if he begins to see himself as the cause, if he begins to demand loyalty, servitude, and sacrifice in his own name rather than the betterment of the cause or the group that he leads, the group will follow suit and divide, each member following their own selfish desires. A leader must recognize that any group is fragile and work to maintain the paragon of fairness in offering finite rewards of riches and safety as well as the infinite rewards of honor and glory to be shared amongst the group, himself included. This has been a production of Minimum Effort Media. If you would like to own a copy of 33 Strategies of War by Robert Greene, please do so using a link in the description below. That will help benefit the channel. I'll also be giving away a free copy of the book all you have to do to enter is be a subscriber with notifications turned on, like the video, and leave a comment down below. The previous winner was randomly selected by me and is on screen right now. Please contact me at the Lazy Stoic across all social media so I can get your contact information. And thank you for watching.